We are moving right along with our little 4.8 versus 8.1 shootout. We've got a David versus Goliath situation going here, and we are pitting the smallest engine that GM put in pickup trucks, a V8, versus the largest one that they put in pickup trucks, an 8.1. And we want to see which one makes more horsepower while staying naturally aspirated. And yes, eventually this 4.8 will get a centrifugal or a turbo or a LSA blower. I don't know what route we are going yet, but right now we have the engine completely, the short block put back together. We did gap the rings to make sure that we didn't have any problems when we run this under boost. I have everything cleaned up and we're ready to start putting in the parts that are actually going to increase the horsepower and we'll start by installing a different camshaft. Uh, will this thing make more power and torque? I don't know. In fact, I don't think it will make more torque. I think we have a pretty good shot of making at least the 306 horsepower at the rear wheels that the 8.1 did, although it will be making its horsepower and torque peaks at a much higher RPM. And because it's a small stroke, small bore engine, I figured let's just kind of double down. Let's accentuate what GM started and let's make a higher RPM power plant. So I picked a camshaft that does have a little bit higher power band than maybe you would want if say you have a daily driver truck or something that you spend a lot of time pulling a trailer with or towing. Um, this cam would probably be, be uh, excuse me, be better suited for like a 5.3 or a 6.0, uh, but it has the following specs. It's got 220 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths on the intake, 224 degrees at 50 on the exhaust. Uh, total lift is 575 on both intake and exhaust, and it has a 112 degree lobe separation angle, 108 degree intake center line, which is four degrees advanced. So, uh, we're going to put it in and see how this thing runs. Um, some other supporting parts that we're going to be installing along with the camshaft are just parts that make sense to put in. Uh, we have an adjustable timing set we got from Summit. We have a degree wheel, that's for you Pat, so we can make sure we know exactly where the cam is installed and make adjustments if necessary. Uh, I've got a new cam retainer plate, uh, new lifters, new lifter trays. Uh, those are flex plate bolts, I don't know why I have those out yet. Uh, we've got valve springs down below there, a valve spring kit, so it has the retainers, the keepers, the seals. Uh, they're a Comp 918 Beehive. And in terms of the cylinder heads that we are running on this, I'm actually going to be sticking with the stock 862 castings. And I did get them cleaned up last night. Um, and the reason why I'm sticking this with this for now is partly budget. Uh, but number two, I didn't want to swap out to... <clears throat> well, let, so let's talk about heads for, for a second because there's a lot of different castings that GM used. These are an 862 and probably the next, the, this is what I would consider a second best head and probably the best one would be a 706 casting, I think. Um, but from what I understand, they're the same exact head, but they used a slightly different core design or a casting method, which meant that the ports on the 862 were just a little bit rougher, although they were pretty much the same shape. Um, you could swap to like a 243 or a million different other heads, but a lot of other LS cylinder heads have a larger combustion chamber, which means you're going to lose compression, which also means drop horsepower. And even though the 862-702 heads do have a smaller valve, uh, that works perfect on a small engine with a tiny bore because if you have a much larger intake valve, it'll be kind of jammed up against the cylinder wall and it won't be able to flow quite as much air around the outsides of it. So. <clears throat> probably uh, when I get this thing together, if I, I probably won't have any mon money left in my quote unquote budget, but um, uh, we may eventually decide to do some more upgrades like a Trailblazer SS intake and maybe some different cylinder heads like some CNC ported 702s, 6s, 704s. I don't know what the numbers are, guys. I'm not an LS expert. I try to work on a lot of different things, but um, that's kind of the name of the game. So we've got a cam swap. We've got the stock heads with valve springs. We're doing long tube headers. I showed you those guys a few videos ago. Uh, we're putting a pretty loose converter in. Eventually we may re-gear to like a 410 or 430. Um, <clears throat> what else? Uh, we have different intake tube. Uh, we're doing full exhaust, three inch dual with an X pipe. That's kind of the layout of this build. But before we get to any of that, we got to get the engine back in, which means we need to install the cam and check its degree to position.
All right, let's talk why are we degreeing a cam? Basically, when you check the degree of a cam, you're making sure that it's installed where you want it to be. And it's important to know that just because the cam card tells you where the intake center line is, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you have to install it because as a builder, you have the option to advance or retard the cam timing to shift the power band around a little bit. Uh, if you advance it, you're gonna shift the power band a little bit lower to make more mid range. Or if you retard the cam timing, make it open and close a little bit later, well, you're gonna make the high RPM power a little bit stronger. And like I said, it's totally up to the builder and just because the cam card says the intake center line of this particular cam is 108 degrees well that doesn't mean that's necessarily where we have to put it but before we make that decision we actually have to know where it is um, so you need a few things to degree a cam you need a degree wheel like this guy here and you need some sort of a dial indicator to measure lift of both the piston and of the lifter the first thing you want to do is start out by actually finding out where true top dead center of the engine is. So we've got this little MIG welding wire pointer and just the degree wheel. I put the dial indicator on top of the number one piston, crank it over until I see maximum lift. I'll tweak the little pointer here to be about zero and then I'll roll the engine backwards uh, by about 50 thousandths less piston lift. And then I'll kind of take a reading. I think I had 13 degrees at 50 thousandths before top dead center. And then I rolled it through, uh, got back to top piston height and continued on to those 50 thousandths down in the hole. And then I think I had about 13 degrees after top dead center. So as long as the number is the same before and after at the same lift of the piston, you know that's where true top dead center is. So that once we have that established, it's time to actually measure the intake center line of the cam. So I have, uh, the sprocket on both top and bottom set at zero degrees because there's adjustable bushings for the top in two degree increments and then there are adjustable keyways on the bottom once again in two degree increments. So as long as you're within like say a degree, really you can't make any finer adjustments than that. But once again, we have to know where things are. So the dial indicator is on the lifter and what I do is I just kind of turn the engine over until I find maximum lift and I think I'm already beyond it now. So also when you're doing this, make sure you turn the engine over in one direction, the direction that it turns, which from the front is clockwise. So I turn the engine over and zero lift is right about there. Um, zero your indicator if you haven't already. And then what you're gonna wanna do is back the engine up quite a bit. Let's go at least beyond 50 and then turn it over once again in the direction of normal rotation and stop at 50 thousandths before uh, max lift, which is right about here. And I already took my measurements, so I know what it is. Um, but at 50 thousandths of before top lift on the camshaft, we had uh, 64 degrees. And then once we continue to rotate this thing through, we'll go to peak lift and the lifter will drop back down and it goes to 50 thousandths again. And at that point I had 151 degrees. And those are the two critical measurements that we need to know, 50 thousandths before peak lift, 50 thousandths after peak lift, and the reading on the indicator. And you add the two together and divide it by two, which gives me, in my particular case, 107.5 degrees. That's where the intake center line of this cam is when it's installed right now. And that's actually right where I want it to be. There is four degrees of advance already built in because it has 112 degree lobe separation. And when they grind the cam for the zero position, which is where we have it now, it's advanced four degrees, which will give this truck a little bit stronger mid range than if we install this cam, quote unquote, straight up, which would be at 112. But to get to 112, I'd have to put a four degree offset bushing in to retard the cam. Anyhow, um, that's where we want it. And it's a great step to just kind of verify that things are where we where they should be. Because let's say down the road, the truck was running funny, we couldn't figure out why it was down on power. Well, if you don't know where the cam is installed, well, that's a huge variable and that can greatly affect an engine's performance. So it's definitely worth your while to check a the degree of a cam. And all in, I mean, uh, this little degree kit from Summit, I think was like 25 bucks. It's just an inexpensive wheel with the degree numbers printed on the outside. You know, this is just TIG wire that I have that doesn't cost anything. And you got to pick up a dial indicator, you can get those practically anywhere. So uh, when you're working on motors, putting different cam shafts in, please, please always make sure you check the degree of a cam. Now in this case, we could have put it together just on the zero setup and it would have been fine because we are half of a degree off and there's no half of a degree bushing to make that correction. So yeah, it would have been fine, but what if it wasn't? What if the, the uh, shoot, the keyway on the crank sprocket, what if that was off a little bit? Um, it's just definitely worth checking. So 
that's my little <laughs> soapbox for the day. All right, so I wanted to get the valve springs in the head so I could get the heads back on the block and kind of bring this engine project to a close and get it back in the truck. But when I started mocking up the valve springs, uh, I didn't quite seem right. So let me show you what we have and show you what the problem is. Uh, what I bought was a Comp 26918 CS kit. It has Beehive valve springs. These will work with like 630 lift and all kinds of RPM. It has the upper valve locks, new valve stem seals, locators, as well as the upper retainers or whatever you want to call those. Um, and that's basically the kit that you get. But there is a little bit of a fitment issue and it might work, but I don't feel great about it. So I'm going to order a replacement part. So let me kind of show you what we're dealing with here. Uh, these are the bottom locators and basically it fits right around the bottom of the valve and it's supposed to keep it from kind of moving around like so. And then of course you have the upper retainer there. The stock locator right here, it's a fairly tight fit. As you can see, it wiggles around a little bit, but the new comp one, it is fairly loose. And that just, to me, that ain't gonna cut it. Uh, we've got 570,000 ID on the locator and the actual valve guide itself is 500 thousandths of an inch, which means we have an extra 70 thousandths of clearance, which just, like I said, it's not going to fly in my book. Is it right? Would it work? Yeah, it might work, but um, I want the right thing. And they actually have a lower 
uh, locator, I can never remember what they're called, that has a 510 ID and all the other dimensions are the same. So I've ordered a set, they're like 60 bucks, not a huge deal and they'll be here Monday morning. So we'll be back in business before you know it. For me, it is Friday at 5.30 at night. So I'm happy to put the brakes on the project right here and then Monday we'll get back on it and we'll start putting the long block together. Um, you will notice basically I have everything together except for the oil pan. The reason why I haven't done that is simply because I'm not entirely sure what power adder I'm going to put on this, but there is a chance it might be a turbo. And since I already have the oil pan off the truck and cleaned up, this is the perfect chance to weld in a drain. So what I did is I ordered, actually two days ago, I ordered a Dash 10 AN as well as a cap. So I'm just going to pop a hole somewhere right in here. That's normally where I put them. I'll weld in the drain and put the cap on it. That way, if I ever do turbocharge the truck, all I got to do is pop the cap and put a drain hose on it and we'll be good to go. So that'll save me a ton of time in the future if I do turbocharge it. And if I don't, not a big deal. I've only wasted like 30 minutes by welding the bung in. Uh, so the very last thing we got to do today is talk about the budget, because if you'll remember, I wanted to make as much horsepower as the 8.1 did when it was naturally aspirated for the same amount of money that I did the 8.1 swap with, which was $3,010. Now, out of that $3,010, the amount of money I spent on the engine, the actual thing that made the horsepower, I was like $2,500. Now, I said $3,000 because that's a good round number, and we've, well, we actually have spent a little bit more than that, but let me give you the breakdown, and this is by category, um, just so we keep everything straight. So this is what I'm calling the go fast part. So we've got long tube headers, X pipe, camshaft, valve springs. I did include the torque converter in here just because it's, uh, yeah, I know a torque converter isn't gonna make the truck, the engine produce more horsepower, but it's sort of part of the upgrades in my opinion. So I did include it, it's my money that I'm spending. Um, <laughs> I also included the mufflers, exhaust hangers, basically everything that's gonna affect the airflow into and out of the engine, as well as the torque converter. Uh, the grand total for the go fast parts, $2,800. So already we are kind of close, I'm gonna trip on my own parts. Uh, we are kind of close to that theoretical budget I said of $3,000, but that's not all the parts that I bought. And because you guys were kind of worried about where the money would go, I did break it down and there are some other areas that we had to upgrade. Uh, right here, this is, I'm just calling it, I don't know, supporting modifications, I guess. Uh, head bolts, wide band gauges, I'll need that for tuning, uh, head gaskets and spark plugs. Altogether, that's another $509. And then down here, we've got another $400 in gaskets, which means this part of the project has cost me $3,800. Um, it's part of building trucks, I guess. You gotta spend money, you gotta replace parts. So we've blown the budget, regardless of how you categorize it. I still may eventually do like a Trailblazer SS and some CNC ported heads, but that'll be another phase. I'm kind of curious to see how much power this truck will put down with the parts that we're doing right now. Thank you guys for watching, I do appreciate it. This video has come to a close. Do me the three favors, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll catch you again in another couple of days. Thanks guys.